What's up, Aikon? Is this on? Can you hear me? Everybody, uh, we, I guess we can sit real quick. All right, I was in a, I had people in the back. I was expecting this room to be so big. How's it going? Hey, everybody. Okay. We, all right, we don't have to do that, but I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So, wow, this is crazy. I think this is probably the most people I've ever talked to in real life, or at least since COVID started. Yeah, it's cool. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming out. Uh, real quick, I just want to introduce Todd, because some of you might not know who he is. Uh, yes, this is Todd. So, uh, I, think, I think this talk could be very valuable to a lot of you, I assume. Uh, you all make videos and, and on YouTube and stuff. And so Todd is actually the head of discovery at YouTube. And honestly, yeah, I would, I would take as far as saying like, there's not a single person on the planet that knows the YouTube algorithm better than Todd, because he, he's worked on it for you know, a huge part of his life. And so it's always very interesting to, to hear his response to the questions that I hear creators asking. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna ask him a couple questions and then he'll ask me questions and we'll kind of go back and forth because I think that's like an interesting format. Um, and just one last thing and then you can uh, jump in. We, we basically source questions from like Discord because a lot of these questions, I kind of feel like I know what he's gonna say, but I think these are things you guys would ask him and vice versa. So try to pick things that would give you guys the most value and should be fun. Yeah, and I realized, Yeah, why is this louder? Hey, there's clearly a lot of Mr. Beast fans in the audience. Um, just want to remind everybody we're here on the creator track and, you know, it's really great for Jimmy to come out and help uh, other creators succeed on YouTube. So let's uh, keep it focused on I think they're here that. for you. I, yeah, I, I know. I'm just a support character. All right, so we'll jump into it. Uh, you should take notes or whatever. I feel like this will be a pretty informationally dense uh, uh, chat. So uh, just to start things off, uh, Mr. Todd, the first thing I wanted to hit you with is uh, what is your job at YouTube? Because I, I feel like they'd love to know that. Yeah, so I, I lead the Discovery product team. And you know I go to a lot of meetings all day. But what I'm really doing is trying to help make YouTube products better for viewers. So I'm really focused on helping each viewer open up the YouTube app and find a video that they're just gonna love watching and make them wanna keep coming back to YouTube. The way I do that is I work with a bunch of like product designers to figure out how can we make the interface more fun to use, uh, make it easier to find videos, work with a lot of machine learning engineers who are working on like pretty high tech. These people have PhDs that are uh, in machine learning that, that can process yeah. data. And, uh, but ultimately it comes down to recommending the right video to the right viewer. Which is perfect, because uh, let's start with the fun one. Uh, how does the recommendation algorithm work? All right, well. Here, everyone get comfortable. It's, it's probably gonna be a long answer. The, the secret is there's actually a bunch of monkeys in this room. Yeah. Is that why a, a monkey pops up when it's, it's the 401? Yeah, that's the, that's the working monkeys whenever there's an error. Yeah. They've been notified. All right, unacceptable answer, tell us. All right, so there's a lot of complexity behind the algorithm, and, uh, but to try to break it down for everyone, there's kind of two key parts that we focus on. One of them being personalization. And that's really about what do we understand about each viewer? Um, and then the other part is performance. And what are we learning about how a particular video is performing uh, more generally as opposed to an individual person? Um, the first thing that a lot of creators kind of get wrong is they think about, okay, I'm gonna upload a video to YouTube and then YouTube's gonna look at my video and it's gonna send it out. Um, while that does happen for notifications, when, it, when you're talking about the recommendations on the homepage or on the, you know, when you're looking at up next while you're watching a video, those recommendations get calculated in real time when somebody opens up the app and hits one of those pages, we gotta figure out what is the best video to show this person in less than a second. And so the first thing we do is we start with personalization, which is like, what do we know about this viewer? We know, okay, well, most viewers on YouTube, it's not their first time, so they have some history of videos they've watched before and channels they've watched before. And so the first thing we're gonna do is lean into that and say, okay, well, we know this person's watched Mr. Beast Gaming and uh, so let's, let's see if Mr. Beast Gaming has any new videos. Okay. And then, um, so we look at the channels that they're subscribed to, the channels they watch, 
We also look at individual videos. So, you know, whether somebody watched a particular Mr. Beast gaming video versus a different one might might like give you they only more watch Minecraft videos or something. Yeah, like maybe that. they're more into Minecraft. And so one of the things that we do is look at like, okay, let's look at this Mr. Beast gaming Minecraft video. What were all the other videos that were watched by everyone who watched that video? Mm -hmm. And so we, for each video, we could kind of come up with a ranked list of the best other videos that audiences tend to watch. And so we can go through, you know, many of the videos in your history, and for each one, kind of pull in, okay, here's some good videos for this video, here's some good videos for that video. And we get hundreds of, uh, maybe thousands of examples of videos that we think this user might like. Well, and, and I think what was interesting when we were talking before we came up, it's like you're, you know, saying that, it's not, when you upload, it's not like it just hands the video to people and all, everyone on YouTube just magically on at all times. It's more when people come on, it finds videos that people want to watch, uh, which is kind of a different perspective than a, a lot of creators look at it, which makes sense. Yeah. So then um, we also have some more sophisticated techniques that we're not going to do like a PhD machine learning class here, but. I mean, that would be fun. <laughs> it would be, but um, we use uh, deep learning is uh, what it's called and it's, it actually models kind of like how the human brain works and learns, where uh, it forms kind of neurons and connections between them. And, you know, the way that, that the machine learns is we feed it a bunch of data about videos that people watch, and it can find patterns and kind of make connections between videos. And so we, we throw everything we know about, about a user and try to map them out and push it through the brain and figure out like what are the closest videos to that that person. Yeah. So um, so that's that's a lot on the personalization side. And the other side I mentioned was performance. So um, we're collecting data in real time, right? So as we start showing a video to, you know, maybe we start with somebody who watches the channel regularly and then uh, we look at what their history is and then we start distributing the video into the list of all the things that person's watched before. And we look at like, well, what did, what did, how did similar people react? How did people who like Minecraft, who watch Mr. Beast Gaming, how did they react when we showed it to them? Did they click on it? Did mm -hmm. they watch? How long did they watch? Did they I like, like I it? I should be writing stuff down right now. Yeah. It's good. Did they dislike it? Did they click not interested in their feed? Did they scroll past it? Did they, uh, you know, another thing that we've been really trying to do over the past couple years is what we call satisfaction. And what that's about is it's, it's more than just watch time because not all watch time is equally valuable to the viewer. How many of you have like gone and watched a video and spent like 10 minutes and when you're done, you're just kind of like, meh, it was okay. And then another video you may have watched, you're like, oh my God, that was amazing. It changed my life. I'm subscribing to this channel. I'm like watching this every day. Um, we really want to reward the videos that make people like really inspired and want to come back to YouTube. And the way that we try to figure that out is not just by looking at how much time people watch, but by running surveys. And we actually get millions of survey responses a day where we, you know, while somebody's scrolling through their homepage, we'll say, hey, what did you think of this video you watched yesterday? And um, that helps us differentiate that stuff. We feed those millions of responses into that brain and it kind of sorts through and finds out what's more satisfying. And that performance, you know, is used to ultimately predict for the viewer that's showing up a bunch of different factors. So it's going to predict, if we show this to the, to the person, are they going to click on it? It's going to predict, you know, and based on what it's learned from other users, uh, how long will they watch it, wh what the probability is they'll like it, and what would they answer if, we, if they did see a survey and we asked them how was the video? I love it, yeah. And then we're able to rank um, all those videos that we, we came up with in the beginning. Uh, and then there's uh, some more stuff that happens after that because sometimes if you just rank the top 10 videos in order based on that score, you might end up with like only one channel's videos at the top. And viewers have told us, like, you know, when they open up YouTube, they want to see a variety of stuff. They just don't want, like, one channel at the top unless it's Mr. Beast. And then it's okay. So, uh, so yeah, we have some more stuff in there to diversify the results. 
But ultimately, all this stuff is trying to do is figure out what's the video you're going to be most interested in watching and that you're going to love, and it's going to make you want to come back to YouTube. So um, one of the things we're trying to figure out more of is like, not only can we predict what you're going to do with this video, but what are you going to do, you know, tomorrow on YouTube? You know, how is this video going to make you, you know, fall more in love with YouTube because it's a great video? And so, uh, yeah, I I love that. I feel like we should give him a round of applause for that. Honestly, <laughs> that was good. I don't. I honestly don't know how it gets much more valuable than that. Um, well, I mean, you can hit me with one of your questions if you want. Now I, I feel bad because I don't, I don't All right. give as much value. So you were a small creator once. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a, probably a lot of creators out there that don't have 97 million subscribers. Something like that, yeah. Um, what would you say to those folks in the audience that are, maybe they're even just starting on YouTube and they don't, you know, yeah, they're I not you. getting... Basically, what would I do if I was a small creator? Yeah, person? how would you get traction? Yeah, Ooh, this is a fun one. Um, well, the big thing is when, when I was a smaller channel, uh, just to be honest, the, the videos I was making sucked, but I thought they were great at the time, but you know, I watch them now and they're, they're pretty bad. Um, and so, you know, I thought they should have gotten views and they deserve to get views, but looking back, like the views I got, I was lucky to get. You know what I mean? Those, they're pretty terrible. So for most of the time when I meet smaller creators, my advice is usually just like, make 100 videos and just improve one thing with each video. Cause like, if you're, you know, if you're not, if <coughs> unless you like made tons of uh, films and stuff like that coming to YouTube, usually you gotta spend a couple years, some of us, it takes a decade like me, to refine your skills and get it where you're actually a good storyteller and good at making videos and good at entertaining people before it even makes sense for you to start getting views. You know what I mean? Um, Cause sometimes, Sometimes we forget, like, the numbers on the screen are real people, you know what I mean? And we're also, there's infinite amounts of videos out there. So until you hone your craft and get really good at it, uh, you shouldn't, shouldn't even really worry about the algorithm too much, which is funny following that up. But uh, because, you know, step one is just getting it where you're making content people want to watch. And then, you know, then getting it where you're making content people have to watch, you know what I mean? Um, and going from there. So ideally, I mean, you know, if you're doing engineering videos like Mark Rover, you can't do 100 videos, so it, take it with a grain of salt based on, you know, the type of content you do, but ideally, you just make a ton of videos, you improve something each time, and you just do that for as long as possible, and, like, you'll notice if you do that for 100 videos, the 100th video will literally be, like, four times better than your first video, if you actually improve something each time. Um, it's, it's pretty hard for it not to be, you know, and so now, that's, so that's basically what I did from, like, 13 to 20, I just made a thousand videos and the thousandth one was just like, oh, it's finally good. People finally want to watch it. Um, and so that's, that's kind of my advice. And then once you get to the point where you're like really confident and the videos are really good, then I would start to worry a little bit more about thumbnails or other things to optimization. But at first, the core foundation is actually making great videos and that's just a skill that takes time. Cool. I, I, I'd add to that some things that I, I've seen talking to some creators is um, I'd encourage you to watch YouTube, be, yes. be a viewer, uh, put yourself in the shoes of somebody who just has, you know, millions of choices. And, you know, if you, you may love Minecraft, um, go, to, go to YouTube and search for Minecraft and look at the videos that are showing up at the top. These, most of these videos are from creators who have, who have, you know, trained for a marathon, so to speak, and, you yeah. know, over many years honing the craft of video skills, and they, a lot of them, you know, Dream, for example, found a way to innovate, you know, they weren't just doing, oh, I'm just making my standard Minecraft house or whatever, they found a way to introduce storytelling or, you know, find something that other people weren't already doing. Uh, because if there's already, you know, 10,000 creators covering something, exactly. you're going to have to do something different to make it interesting to people and make them want to click your video instead of somebody else's. Yeah. And uh, it'll build from there. Agreed. All right. So let's talk about um, ideas for content. You've had a journey where, you know, you started out doing gaming content, you went into like counting to 100,000, reading the dictionary, you know. Tell us about your journey on, on deciding what content to make yeah. and 
you know, how is it today? Like, you know, how has it changed over time? Uh, yeah, uh, that's actually a perfect one to follow up what you just asked me. Essentially, just every video of my entire life, I've always tried to just get better with each video. And so, yeah, I mean, that's how it started with just terrible videos with a <laughs> terrible laptop. And then we worked up to, you know, eventually recreating Squid Game. Um, I don't know. I just, it's like, it's kind of hard because I'd have to take you through the entire history of my life. But just if every video you're improving something and you just, you know, probably now it's been 11 or 12 years, those like little improvements just add up. And over time, it just, you know, it looks like um, some big leap happened, but it was like just very gradual over time, you know, which you, you probably already know that. But uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's, that's really the answer for me. It's just like small improvements over time is like most people don't just go from like, doing a Minecraft video to then making Squid Game the next month, you know what I mean? Like there's usually like a four or five year gap in between to like get up to there. Um, and then also for me, I'd, I've just always reinvested all the money I made. So when I got my first brand deal, I gave it away and up to this day, we just spend the money on content. So that kind of helps. So if you're always improving and you're just reinvesting the money, eventually it just keeps growing. Do you feel like there's a, do you feel like you're leading the audience uh, in terms of where you're going in a content perspective, or you feel like they're leading you? Like, how do you feel like that push and uh, pull happens? Yeah, I would, I guess uh, I'm leading the audience in a way, because I, you know, a lot of people, <laughs> you know, think they know what they want to watch, and, you know, they'll be like, oh, I, I want to see these, and then you do something different that's bigger, and they're like, oh, actually, I like that, you know? Um, and so I try not to do, like, a series for too long, right? Like, I could... Like back in the day, I used to donate to Twitch streamers to see what their reaction were. We would just donate 10 grand and, and see what they would say. Uh, and people loved those videos. We probably did like 15 of them. But I can't do that forever. You know, that's not just going to be my entire YouTube career. So you do at some point, you know, or at least for us, we, you know, sometimes have to like make a decision. Like even though this series is doing well, we need to evolve. We can't just keep doing the same thing forever. Like if I made 150 of those, I would just become the guy who donates to Twitch streamers. You know what I mean? Or and like that's obviously not what I want. I want to keep growing and innovating and adapting. So, yeah, I guess it's just kind of trying to trying to trying to predict the future instead of like running something into the ground and then pivoting. Kind of just be like, okay, it's probably about to run into the ground. Let's just pivot before it does and like find the next series and adapt. Yeah, I, I often uh, hear the analogy. I think maybe Henry Ford or someone said that if you ask people like at the, the beginning of the 1900s what they wanted for transportation, they'd say faster horses when really they wanted cars. Yeah. Um, and so you have to be careful. You don't, you know, if you want to lead uh, in innovation, you got to be a creative creator. It's called a creator for a reason because you got to be creative. Yeah, and, and you know, not every video did well. So sometimes when you are innovating and you're, and you're trying all these different things, you're going to have videos that flop, and that's just part of it, you know. Um, so as long as you're, you know, one little 10 out of 10 doesn't scare you, <laughs> that's, uh, you just keep adapting and innovating, and eventually you'll hit it. Um, talking about small creators, um, just want to emphasize to all the creators out there that are wondering if YouTube cares about, like, small creators or Ooh, or, or uh, just like big ones like Mr. Beast. And, you know, we do care about small creators. We actually have teams that are dedicated to making sure that small creators can still break through on YouTube. Um, and we're trying to figure out, you know, it's a harder, it's a harder problem whenever you have a creator that you know nothing about, they upload a video, maybe it is about Minecraft. It's like just knowing that this is a video about Minecraft doesn't really tell you much about who's going to be interested in watching it. Um, so there's only so much you can get from just the, the title um, and the description. And really, the magic of, I think, the recommendation system is being able to collect that feedback from the audience uh, and figure out, well, how did people actually react to it? Um, that's the best way of knowing who's going to like it is by seeing who already likes it. Yeah. And so uh, these teams that are focused on small creators are looking at things like, well, how many creators today made it to, like, 300 subscribers for the first time. There's thousands of channels that are doing that every day. Every day? Yeah, every day. Really? And so, um, and then they go on, and we care about them moving up. Um, and so, uh, it, it's something we care a lot about. And uh, it's a hard problem, but uh, we're trying to find the balance. So, we call it uh, the explore exploit problem. So, exploit is whenever you already have a lot of information about a video or about a, a person, a viewer. And you're just able to kind of use that. Like, 
once we know which channels you like and and which videos are, are just yeah, being clicked by everyone, that's an easy thing point. to recommend. Um, whereas Explore is like, okay, we have all these videos over here. No one's really watched them. Maybe there's a diamond in there that is the next Mr. Beast. How can we like find uh, find out who's going to watch them? And we're really trying to to uh, find ways to introduce them to viewers um, more intelligently. Yeah, well, and to even more elaborate on that, I, I know some people who just, you know, they, they love YouTube and, and they're uh, just like Patty Gallios and people like that that just like study like crazy. And I have a friend who like had uh, helped a YouTuber with like 100 subscribers and we helped him like optimize the video and it ended up getting like a million and a half views without us pushing it. So I know it does work. If a video is clicked and watched a high percentage and the viewers enjoy it, it'll just get like 100 views, then the next day 1,000 and 10,000 and just keep climbing. Um, so it's funny to see it work in real time because you can kind of almost think like what it's thinking there. It's like, oh, these 10,000 people liked it. Let's give it to 50,000. It's like, oh, they liked it. And it keeps growing, um, which is what's interesting. So, so you talked about, um, you know, making better videos and just like, getting better and better. So when it comes to analytics and metrics, a as you're kind of learning what people like, what, what, what did you look at? Um, when I was growing, well, when I was growing, you couldn't see CTR. I don't know if a lot of you are new YouTubers. Like five years ago, they didn't show click-through rate. Um, so it was a lot more brutal of a climb for us because we would like look at all the videos and all the data that was in the studio. And we couldn't really ever figure out why certain videos with 70% retention and high AVD did well, and other ones with the same stats did bad. Uh, and so that was like, I was very perplexed for many years. And then, I, whatever it was, like four years ago, you guys show, uh, started showing CTR, so we could see the click through on videos. And then it kind of made sense. So it's like, oh, thumbnails uh, do matter. Um, and so that, that was great. Um, but obviously, you guys have it. So for me, the only thing, I don't even really look at that as much anymore. I, well, after I upload a video, I just kind of look at the retention chart and just try to see, like, where did I mess up? You know, why, why are there dips? How could I have made it better? Um, and that's really, I mean, there's there's infinite amounts of data, and, like, because we do channels in different languages, sometimes I look at the countries, and there's, like, you use other stuff, but 99% of the time I just upload a video and then just see, you know, did I lose retention, where at? And, like, that's it's really all you need, and then you take notes, and then you, you know, fact check it against previous videos to see, okay, well, I sneezed here and lost viewers. Did that happen the last times I sneezed in videos, or, or is it just like a, a coincidence? Was this just a boring part of the video? Um, and then you just kind of take those and you gather enough notes over time where you kind of just start to see like, oh, well, the retention isn't as great when the rooms are dimly lit. You know, people prefer a little bit brighter rooms or, or whatever, probably because sometimes it might be hard to see. Um, and you just kind of gather all these notes and, and that's really it uh, at this point. Um, yeah, because it's pretty simple. If people watch the videos, usually they do pretty well. How how often do you uh, change a thumbnail on a on a video? Is that something do you um, usually just stick with one, or you try? Well, different so ones? Well, I think <laughs> we we get better at making thumbnails every year. So it's more when I upload a thumbnail, I usually think it's good, and I don't change it most of the time. But what happens is like three years later, I look back and I'm like, oh, that's a horrible thumbnail. And so it's usually like every two years we just go back and update a lot of our older thumbnails just because they're terrible. Um, uh, just with like the new knowledge we have and what we've learned. And funny enough, act that actually usually does help quite a bit when we update the thumbnails on old videos. Uh, they usually do see a little bit of an uptick because they're just, you know, if we take an old thumbnail where it's like uh, seeing if whatever, like uh, a thousand, a hundred thousand magnets can stop a car and it just looks terrible. And then with the new stuff, I know we zoom in a little bit so it's a little more visible and make things look better. Then magically it starts doing a little bit better because now people actually understand what it is because I'm not as uh, much of an idiot anymore. Um, so yeah, I don't even remember what you asked, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you usually have a vision for the thumbnail in mind whenever you start course, a video? Yeah. yeah. I wish. Uh, you know, it would be fun. I wish there was like a, a little projector I could sh uh, throw things up. We usually sketch out the thumbnails. Uh, Chucky's somewhere in here. He does it for me. Uh, we sketch out the thumbnails beforehand to kind of see if we, we like it. Like one of our upcoming videos, we're going to have people put their hand on a jet and then last take it off keeps it. And so it's like funny doing the little sketches of it like because we're trying to figure out how do you show a, a jet but also like show people because people are small and you got to be able to see them. So we just get it where it's like, okay, this is good because a lot of people do the inverse. They film the video and then they realize, oh, I don't like the thumbnail, but you're in too deep. You already filmed the video, so you kind of just you know, have to make do, or I'd rather have that existential crisis before I film the video, that way 
uh, I can make changes. Are there any uh, metrics that you think creators might focus too much on or not enough on? Or uh, metrics. Um, that's a good one. I think. I think just in general, for the most part, people just don't focus enough on like. I would love to hear more people, which I think because you asked me back there, you're going to ask me in a minute. But I'd love to hear more people talk about like how to become a better storyteller, how to like improve ways of like making better videos and less about like how to game the algorithm or, or things like that. Because, you know, the thing I've noticed and I think most people have noticed, like the people who just make great videos usually do pretty well. You know what I mean? People who are doing things different or interesting. So I'd, I'd love to hear probably just a little less talk about the algorithm because the algorithm is literally just the audience. You know, you're just giving the viewers what they want to watch. You're giving people what they're going to click and what they're going to watch. And so it's kind of irrelevant that it's what more matters is like how do you make a good video that people want to watch and I would love to just see more people talk about that if that makes any sense. Yeah, usually when when people come to me with algorithm questions they're like what time should I upload for the algorithm or like how often should I upload for the algorithm? I yes. I encourage them to replace the word algorithm in their question with audience. So like you really need to know your audience and say what time should you upload for your audience. And if you're writing things down, that is what I would write down. Like any, literally any time you use the word algorithm, just replace it with audience. Like, because it, it really is true. I hear, I actually do the same thing because people will be like, should I, should I upload at midnight? Will the algorithm punish me? And like, it's literally simple. It's like, are your viewers on at midnight? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like it's just a simple question. But I, uh, you know, and I'm guilty of doing that too. Um, and it's kind of funny once you just start interchanging the words, things start clicking. You're like, oh well. Yeah, they're, a lot of them are probably asleep. I guess I'll just wait, you know? Yeah, I'll, I'll put in a plug in terms of metrics that I think creators don't spend enough time looking at and that help them understand the audience, and that would be the audience tab in analytics. Um, there's a lot of metrics inside the uh, uh, analytics studio, but you kind of have to click on the tabs to get in there. The audience tab will tell you things like, what are other videos that your audience watched this week? Yeah, um, th which that is interesting. Yes, yeah, so you can get a better flavor for like the interests of your audience that way. It also can show you things like what videos attracted a new audience to your channel that came back to watch more. And that's, you know, because as, as you remember, YouTube is trying to figure out what videos to recommend people so they keep coming back to YouTube. Well, if somebody watches one video from your channel and then they never come back, that's kind of a sign that it wasn't that great. But if they start watching a particular video and then they keep coming back to your channel, that's a good signal we're going to use to to try to show that to people. Or even better, they watch one video and they watch 20 on the channel. Then I mean, yeah. I couldn't think of a better signal. Like, oh, this guy clearly likes this channel. Yeah. Yeah. So I would I would recommend the the audience tab in analytics, and then also there's another hidden feature that I think a lot of people don't know about. It's it's a comparison feature where you can compare all your videos. Um, against each other, controlling for time, like what what videos got my most uh, views in like the first week or in the first yeah, 28 well, days. Yeah, that one, um, yeah, because you can group videos and compare to other groups, which that is uh, an interesting one. You know, for the most part, on a in video by video basis, I usually just look at the retention chart to see if it was successful. But obviously, if we're just analyzing the channel as a whole, the grouping um, feature is interesting because you can like, if you have multiple series on your channel, you can uh, group them together and see like which ones drive more subscribers or which ones have longer watch time or things like that. Like just a, a weird thing is like back in the day, I gave my three million subscriber three million pennies, my four million subscriber four million pieces of popcorn. Like I would do these uh, things every time I hit a m subscriber milestone. And so we grouped those up and then we compared it to a group of like normal videos. I mean, and it's obvious, but those videos like converting subscribers like crazy because obviously the theme of the video is subscribing. So like people are just like, oh, I guess I'll subscribe. Um, but you could get like cool insights like that when you group videos and compare it to, to other groups. Yeah. yeah, and then the the comparison feature, I think you go into advanced mode and then like comparison, um, and you can look at like uh, compare videos like based on the first 24 hours. Yeah, I feel like I haven't asked you a question in a while. Let's see. Um, uh, ooh, this one looks like a fun one. Um, so, can a video's potential be stopped if you know, the channel subscribers decide not to interact with the new video? Yeah, this is a, a question we hear a lot of creators. They're concerned that maybe th they're trying to experiment with a new format or a new type of content, and they're worried that, oh, if my existing audience doesn't like this, you know, and so 
the, the algorithm's going to recommend it to them, and then they're not going to click on it, or they're going to click on it, and then not, not like yeah, it. Basically, if your subscribers don't like the video, is it just dead in the water and never going to live? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, again, we want to get the video in front of the viewer who wants to watch it. And, you know, if you actually look at your analytics, you'll find that it's pretty rare that your video is only shown to subscribers. Um, in fact, most... Most channels I know, most of their, their views come from yeah, non-subscribers. Yeah, even us with 90 plus million, most of our views are from non-subscribers. Yeah, and so uh, we're not going to only show it to people who've watched your channel before um, because the subset of subscribers that do watch it, and some of them will and like it, we're going to see what else those people like and then show it to people like them and not people like... Um, the ones who don't watch it. And your subscribers generally are actually pretty diverse. You like, you know, humans want to simplify things down and kind of assume, oh, I, every subscriber, like, they just want to watch all my videos. It's not that simple. People have different interests. They want to watch different things. And we try to find the patterns that work. And, you know, we don't just look at, oh, well, a few subscribers didn't like it, so no one's going to like it, because that's not true. Yeah, but still, if you pivot too hard and you know, you're making videos about painting bowling balls, and then one day you just start doing videos about massages, then it's gonna, you're gonna basically alienate a lot of your subscribers. So it still will probably eventually find the audience that likes videos about learning how to do massages or whatever. But ideally, when you do pivot, you do it slow over time uh, and not so just harsh, because <laughs> uh, that is one thing, uh, just because you inspired me when you were talking about that, a lot of people, when they like try new content, they're like, oh, the, the algorithm hates me for you know trying something new or the algorithm hates this. But again, replace it with audience is like, imagine you're watching SpongeBob and you watch 100 episodes of SpongeBob and the 101st is just adventure time. You'd be like, what, what is this? This is confusing, you know? Um, and that's kind of how your audience is too if you make a pivot too quickly. So ideally it's like just a little bit over time and you slowly switch over to new content. It's not super abrupt. Yeah, I'd also say be patient with uh, with the with the traffic too, because if you if you are pivoting to something new, and you're you're, you're kind of used to if you're being consistent and your core audience is watching something, and then you switch, it is going to take the algorithm a bit more it's, time. I literally had that happen with someone like two days ago. He was freaking out because he made this video. It was around like the uh, trial that was going on with the Johnny Depp stuff and. Uh, it was it was a pretty interesting one, breaking it down. And I, I thought, I told him it would do well. And then he uploaded it, and it didn't do as hot. And then I was like, just wait a week. And he's like freaking out every day, like, will this do well, will this do well? And then like after like six days, he's like, oh, it's, it's doing phenomenal. And you see it pick up. And exactly, uh, especially like the more further it is from what you normally do, you just got to give it a little time to get picked up. Yeah, don't obsess too much on the real-time stats. I know that when you upload, you're you're pretty excited to see, you know, was this a good video? Um, sometimes it can, it can take a few days, and so just have patience and uh, don't sweat it too much. Love it. Let's see. Um, okay, Here, here's a good one. So what, if you were us, like, what, what would you do with shorts? Or, or what are, how are you integrating shorts with long form or, or whatever? I just want to kind of, like, inspire you. Tell, tell us about shorts, and, and how do you think us long form creators should approach them? Yeah, I think the first thing I'll say about shorts is that uh, we're, we're kind of still in the first innings of shorts. Uh, it's been amazing to see the growth of it. I think we just announced that like, we have now 1.5 billion uh, people a month that are watching shorts and uh, really? over 30 billion views a day. Um, and so there's a lot of viewer attention on shorts. Um, and we're actually seeing a variety of different ways that creators are using them. So, of course, we have... Creators that are already doing long form content, experimenting with shorts. Some of them, you know, I think there's different strategies and my advice to you is to try to figure out like what is your goal with shorts? Are you trying to deepen engagement with your current fans? And um, that might ha have one content strategy. Or you could be saying, hey, I wanna like experiment in a new direction. Um, you know, maybe maybe I could use this as like an experiment platform to see what are some other things I could do without kind of, uh, you know, taking risks in my in my main long form section. Yeah. Um, how about you? Do you think that you're, do you think about shorts as serving your current audience? Or are you trying to acquire new new viewers? Yeah. Well, I, I think you hit it on the head. It's still a little new, so we're all still figuring it out. I I will say I've. I've 
I noticed a lot of people have started doing them, like Brian Trahan, ARAC, and just a lot of my friends in general are doing them, and it's, it seems to be a, a huge net positive. I mean, they're getting more subscribers. It doesn't seem to be hurting their, their long-form viewership. So it, uh, it is cool to see how it's developed. Actually, uh, one of my friends, Dylan's here. He was just uh, showing me a couple days ago. He started going really hard on shorts, and uh, we are just looking at how it's actually helped his long-form content a little bit. Like some of the people that are watching the shorts are actually going and watching his longer videos. Um, which is cool because he like, didn't upload a long form video, then he uploaded a short that went viral, um, and then his revenue like skyrocketed even though shorts don't make money because just his uh, long form videos just started getting more views, um, and it was driving a little bit of traffic over. So Yeah, I, I know a lot of creators, including you, have been concerned about like, oh, well if I upload shorts and you know they don't monetize the same way as, as long form, is that gonna like, hurt my channel, uh, and so we did some data analysis of that. We have some data scientists that looked at channels that were doing long form only and channels that were doing long form and shorts, and we did see that the ones that were doing shorts as well were actually growing faster and had more success, and so it's, it's not gonna like reduce. Well, I also, yeah. I think it's clear that's kind of the direction things are going, like short form is here to stay and only gonna get bigger and bigger, so you know, I think eventually, y even if it's not ideally perfect right now, eventually you guys are gonna figure out a way to fully integrate it in. And so it's just a thing, like, if you're not really doing it now, like, you should be. Yeah, one, one story to give you a sense of, like, how things work in, in my day-to-day. -day. When we first launched Shorts, uh, one thing that happened with the algorithm in the, in the long form is that a, a viewer would go, and maybe they go into Shorts and watch, like, t 200 short videos. And then they'd, they'd go back outside of shorts to just kind of like the main YouTube. And the algorithm actually wasn't used to seeing viewers watching a bunch of short videos and then going back to watching long videos. And so when, when the algorithm saw a viewer, oh, look, the last 200 videos this viewer watched were all under a minute. This viewer is like, they only want to watch short videos. And so it, it basically stopped recommending those viewers long form content in the main YouTube. And, and viewers, you know, started complaining to us and that one of my jobs is to listen to what viewers are saying. And, and so what we did at that time was say, okay, the algorithm doesn't know hand, how to handle shorts and, and treat that the right way, so we're gonna split off uh, the history for the viewers. So when a viewer goes into the main YouTube, we're gonna not pay attention to what shorts they watch because we don't want the algorithm to get the wrong idea. But, but what that means is since we did that, that there isn't much of a bridge from short to long form. So if, if a viewer does discover a channel in shorts and then goes back to long form, right now the, the system doesn't actually know that they, wa they discovered that channel um, because we disconnected it. And so one of the things the team is working on right now is building that bridge back in yeah. and making sure that the system can actually understand, oh, let's give the system the context that they watch these shorts videos in shorts. So they were in like a shorts mode, and then it can learn, oh, okay, well, when the user's in sh shorts mode, I'll give them shorts, and when they're not, you know, I can, I can understand that context. That's, that's the types it. of things that we add to the system so they can do the right thing. So much, so much information. Uh, r just real quick, is there like a certain amount of time or can we just keep uh, blabbering? I, I still have more questions. We got about 10 more Oh, Are we 10? Are we allowed to go over? I'm having fun. Um, I don't know. I'll go till they make me get off the stage. Um, so let me see. We, we kind of have like, we ramble a little bit. So a lot of the questions I was gonna ask you, we kind of already hit, so I just wanna like. Let me, let me ask you one okay, about. Go um, for it. So you, you have a, a, a big user base now, but I also know you wanna grow. Um, do you f do you feel tension between serving people who've been like following your channel for like five years versus like trying to bring in somebody new who yeah uh, like one of the things that I, I remember talking about at Vid Summit I was looking at your channel and one thing it was before Squid Game came out um, so you hadn't had that mega banger two hundred and are you two hundred and some million yeah. view video yet and. Uh, we were looking at the returning viewer and new viewer uh, data, and what what surprised me is like a, a, um, about a third of your viewers that month had not watched your channel at all in the previous year. 
Yeah. And that was like amazing to me that such an established creator was still getting, you know, a third of its audience from people just like just watching for the first time. Is there anything you want to say about like new viewers and? Yeah, uh, I, I uh, that one's definitely uh, one where I don't. There are different approaches at work. Like you know, there are people who have like super tight knit communities who are killing it. Like hypothetically, Moist Critical or Ludwig, and then you know people who make a little bit more broad videos like me. So I want to be careful because I don't want to like tell like imply that there's only one way of doing it. But for us, we like to make videos that anyone could just jump into any video and basically you know start watching and understand it. So uh, because you know if you want to get as many views as possible, that's like kind of one of the things you got to be able to appeal to people, um, you know, for the most part, like if someone's 40 and wants to watch it or someone's 15, you know what I mean? Uh, and it just so happens that my humor and, and the way I act just kind of lines up where we can kind of do it. Um, so yeah, to answer it, I think we try to make videos that newer view viewers would enjoy as well as people who've been watching for five years. But, um, you know, other people, you know, have a lot of inside jokes and a lot of just, you know, um, less, you know, bigger barrier to entry, but once you're in there, you're you kind of are just like a lifelong fan. And so kind of the, any approach works, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, it's one of those things where I don't want to like push people one direction because there's just infinite amounts of, of ways people go about it and they, they're all successful, you know? Let, maybe let's go back to storytelling. So um, yeah, at, at Vid Summit last year, uh, Hayden Hillier Smith got up and he's a, top editor for a bunch of uh, top YouTubers. Yeah, and, and he's, he's started editing some of our videos. He's great, he kills it. Yeah, yeah so he, he got up on stage and basically said, stop looking at analytics. Uh, people are too obsessed with analytics and they've forgotten how to tell a story. And so I know that that's, you know. It's kind of funny <laughs> hearing you quote that. Yeah. <laughs> well, jokes. I mean. I jokes, I know. Yeah, no, I, I think that, that when you do tell a story, it affects the analytics. Yeah, right, agreed. and so yeah. it's a tool for. How, how have you thought about how does storytelling work? Like, how has that been different for you, and maybe some of your early videos, like versus more yeah. your your videos that are more focused on storytelling? How do you tell a story? Yeah, that's where for me I've always struggled with it because you know since we get so many views of videos, sometimes it's like hard to tell who which people you know, to give depth to when we have people in a video. Like if we have 50 people put their hand on a Lamborghini, you know, which ones to like give depth in and how much depth do you show for a person? Cause you know, a lot of storytelling is getting people attached to, the audience attached to someone. So then like the payoff at the end's bigger or whatever. Um, so that's something honestly, I'm still trying to figure out. Cause a lot of times when uh, people are explaining things, I, I feel like it's pretty boring and I usually cut it out. But then other people are like, oh my gosh, that's so interesting. I would love to know more about them. Um, but in general, there's a book called uh, Save the Cat, which Hayden, it's funny, we keep talking about him, but he's obsessed with storytelling. That's all, all he ever talks about. So it, it's fun. Cause every t I talk to him like a couple times a year, and every time I do, he just brain dumps me on like a million things he's learned. But he recommended a book called Save the Cat, which is kind of a book about that. I won't go in depth, but if you want to know more about storytelling, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, I thought yeah. Your, your most recent video with the like uh, solitary confinement, uh, yeah. the guy that was in there for many days, yeah. Um, w was there any like um, back and forth on that one in terms of like retention and storytelling or? Yeah, I mean, that one was a little bit easier because it was one guy. We basically put a person in a room and every day he stayed in the room, we got $10,000. Um, so since we, he went, I think 23 days, we had plenty of content to like build the story around and, and kind of play with. So that one was kind of just cheat codes because you know, we have like 300 hours worth of footage. <laughs> so it's pretty, pretty hard not to like make a pretty good story out of it. You know what I mean? Um, here, let me see if I got anything for you. Let's do this. Um, what, um, what interesting trends are you seeing on the platform? Um, there's a lot of, lot of things happening. So when the pandemic hit, one of the surprises for me was the, you know, I think everybody kind of expected there was a uh, viewership spike, right? Because people were like stuck in their houses, they didn't have much to do, they watched YouTube. Um, but what surprised me was like the creation spike. Um, Cause I was kind of thinking, well, it'd be harder to make videos cause you can't kind of get together with people. But we saw a surge in creation. And then, um, you know, especially in live, live has really been taking off on the platform. Interesting. And so uh, I think, you know, people are using live as a way to just feel more connected to other people because it's more of a simultaneous experience. 
they could chat with each other, things like that. Um, you know, also during the pandemic, a lot of young people like had to learn how to learn online, right? Instead of going to school. So learning has been growing. Um, shorts obviously is a is a huge thing. Yeah. Um, let's see. What, let's uh, kids just got out of school or whatever, you know. So like, how does that? Or like, what are other seasonal things you'd love to? Yeah, uh, seasonal things about? typically happen. Like what you'd expect when school gets out is that. Um, Rather than having a lot of like spiky traffic on weekends, uh, you get more consistent traffic throughout the week. Okay. And so. So like on uh, during the summer, like or during when people are in school and, and busy during the day, you know, obviously traffic spikes on weekends. That's why I upload on Saturdays, um, and that is something I've noticed as well. But during the summer, it's way more consistent. Like we basically say every day is a Saturday, you know, like two months of the year. Yeah, or it, it might spread out a little bit more. So if you're used to like uploading on a spiky Saturday and now that school's out, you know, people aren't necessarily just waiting till Saturday. They're watching throughout the week. You may see fewer views on Saturday, but by the end of the week, it's the same or, or more. So yeah. that's why you shouldn't focus too much on like the real time because it, you know, it could just be people are well, doing, doing they'll, other they'll things. If someone watches your videos, eventually when they log on, it will pop up there because, like you talked about before, it, when people open up YouTube, it brings them videos. Not when you upload, it finds people for the videos. So right, yeah. An uh, another so big uh, thing we're seeing is is the growth in watching on on living room, uh, like gaming consoles or smart TVs. Uh, that's the fastest growing platform at YouTube. Mobile is still the number one way people watch. But, um, you know, we're uh, seeing huge growth in TV, so that's something for you to think about, what's going to look good on the big screen uh, or a small screen. Yeah, I wanted to see if I could see. Do you, can you see it on your phone, your TV viewership? So I, I agree. I mean, most of YouTube I watch is on a TV now. Now I'm curious if I could just say what it is. Oh, well, can't find it. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, you know, obviously... I. I have never used cable in my life, and so uh, now I mostly just watch videos on my TV. Every morning I, I just wake up and watch Windover Production, Polymatter, and stuff like that on the TV. Um, we, let's, uh, what, what's something that, so you're, you're always trying to make better videos. Now you have a team, you know, they don't, may not have as much experience making videos as, as you. Um, what are you all kind of finding a need to remind folks to not forget about doing when you're making a, trying to make a better video? Is there anything that comes up that's like... Yeah, for the people that work with me, um, that's a specific question. What do I usually need to remind them of? I mean, I think a lot of people that I work with usually forget, like, they try to find, like, what, what's the easiest way to do something or, you know what I mean? Like, if I need a submarine to spend 50 hours in or... Or, uh, you know, if I would have put a basketball court in the cloud and played basketball in the sky or something. like. But instead of As looking one at does. It, yes, yes. Uh, but instead of looking at, like, how do we make the best content possible, even if it's harder, usually they look at it, what's the easiest way to accomplish it? Which usually, you know, there's a harder way that makes better content. And I would love to, you know, I like to be able to make the decision on the trade-offs. You know, like, ah, it's not worth the effort, but this is. Um, so for people working with me, that's usually the biggest thing is, like, adjusting your head to like, it doesn't really matter how hard it is. We're just trying to make the best video possible, which is like obviously in traditional film, like kind of the opposite of how they do it. Um, is there anything that like you forget or they forget to um, remember to film or incorporate into the video? Um, hmm. um, let's see. Well, one thing, <laughs> it's funny. How, I like how specific they're getting, but um, we, I like to try to end the videos with like s a joke or like some type of emotional response. Like, like if you watch a video and you laugh at the end, I just feel like you're more likely to watch another video because it's just like, oh, it makes you think the video was better than it is. Um, so I usually try to like end the video with something cool, but we forget a lot. Like, you know, because if we film for 50 hours and at the end, you know, and I'm in the desert, I usually just like, I don't care. I want to go take a nap. Um, but ideally, yeah, that's, it's since I think you asked, like, what are things we forget sometimes? It's that. Usually trying to end the video on an emotional note, because we're, we're usually so worn out by the end, we're just like, oh, oh well. <laughs> uh, let's see. I wish, uh, you know, I wish I had some more juicy stuff to ask you. But we, we kind of we kind of hit all the questions I really had for you. I mean, like, I have a couple other ones, but when we were just rambling. Yeah, go ahead. Far, we covered them. No, I mean, let me think. Um, 
like, what are you excited about with the with the future or, or whatever on YouTube? Um, I'm excited about like how everybody's kind of woken up to the fact that the creator economy is a thing. And it's like, I remember in 2020 when the pandemic hit and we were seeing a surge in activity, like news outlets started focusing on, oh, there's actually like a creator economy where some creators can like make money on the internet. Yeah. And we were like, what? Welcome to the party. We've been doing this for a, a bit. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm excited. I, I, I've been at YouTube over eight years, and, and I stay there because I really appreciate the values of the company, like really trying to do the right thing by creators. Like 15 years ago, we started sharing revenue with creators uh, on their videos. So 15 years? Yeah, since That's the partner crazy. program started. Wow. Yep. And... Yeah, I think the next era that we're moving into is, you know, a lot of people are talking about multiple formats. And, you know, whether it's short form, long form, whether you want to do image posts with memes or live streams or, uh, you know, live shopping seems to be something that's coming up as a trend. I heard uh, in October there was a creator in China that sold almost $2 billion worth of uh of lipstick or makeup, whatever. Yeah, yeah in one day. Scheme. Yeah, which is crazy if you haven't. Uh, that's actually true if you want to Google it and read about it. Um, you know, actually, what I was thinking, if they don't kick us off, if any of my friends out there, if you want to just text me some questions to ask him or text me things you want me to talk about, that would be fun. Like, what are, what are some things I'm missing? Um, uh, and I don't know. If you want to hit me with another one. I mean, here, you've been waving your hand for forever. You can, let's do it. Just go ahead and come on up. Come, come up to the stage. Every time I look at Todd, he's been waving in the background. So this whole time. Thanks very much. My name's Joey. So I have over 2 billion views under my belt. Been doing this for, Let's go. Uh, actually, since I went to my first VidCon, my daughter dragged me to it nine years ago. Uh -huh. I said, wow, you can make money doing this? Okay. Um, here's my question. Is that we know that CTR and AVD are the two most important things for the algorithm. Yeah, audience. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and uh, that's click-through rate and average view duration. Um, and and um, lately, YouTube's done two things, I think, to impact AVD. One is the introduction of chapters, which basically means that, hey, tell us the chapters, like in a book, and then the viewers can skip to the good parts. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, that seems like that would lower AVD. The other thing is, is that now we see this this most watched wave. You hover a video and you can see, oh, these are the best parts. I feel yeah. like that kind of impacts how long they watch because oh, I can just skip the boring parts and get to the good parts. So here's my question. And, and by the way, I, I saw an interview with you on Creator Insider channel, which everybody should watch. If you're in the business of making money on YouTube, you'd be remiss not to watch this channel. It's fantastic. It's usually on your dashboard. It just pops up whenever they upload. Yeah, yeah. I watched it before I was on the dashboard. It's really good. And it keeps you informed on everything latest. But somebody, they asked you a question once. And what's more important, um, um, the, the um, amount of view time, absolute minutes, or the percentage watched? And the question was something along the lines of, what's better, 10 minutes of a 20-minute video or 7 minutes of a 10-minute video? And you s your answer was, well, more is better. I'm like, okay, <laughs> more minutes or more time? Yeah. We've never, you know, I've been doing this for eight years, and I still don't know the answer to this question. I, I, I mean, that one I can hit you with. Uh, on the, I, there was a couple ones, but I'll, I'll start with the last one. Um, the, the answer from everything I've seen, uh, no, let, let them hang out with us up here. Oh, we're kicking them off? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah uh, it's fine. It's, uh, so, ideally, you know, in a perfect world, the, the longer the video is that you can still hypothetically hold 70% retention, the better. I mean, because you got to look at it in a sense of like, you're also kind of competing with every other video and stuff like that. So typically the harder it is to do something, the better it will do. You know, if you can get 70% retention on a 30 minute video, I don't know, I've never met a single creator that could do that at scale. So of course it's going to go more viral than if you got 70% on a 10 minute video. Well, obviously while people still rate high on surveys and like, like the video. So I like to look at more from a frame of mind as like, what is more difficult? And typically what's more difficult is done less, so it will be rewarded more, because the algorithm's like, oh, this is, this is insane, we've never seen this before. Audience, you know, oh, this is insane, I've never watched a 30 minute video and actually loved it before, this is crazy, you know what I mean? Uh, so that's kind of the stance I like to take. Uh, make, 
I try to aim for 70% retention because, like, I just – whenever I look at other people's analytics, I usually see 50 or 60. So I, I feel like 70 is just so crazy. Or if you can get 10 million people to watch on average 70% of a long video, it's like – that's just, you know, it's kind of like – it just is a good signal that people enjoyed it, and it's a good sign. Um, and so I try to aim for 70%, and then, you know, at the longer the video is, the, the while still maintaining it, typically the better, in my opinion. I don't know if you want to jump in. Yeah, I mean, the, the message is to make the, make the video as long as it needs to be to Agreed, though, while you yeah. keep the audience's retention. And if you see the retention dropping, then you're probably making it too long. Yeah, because there's no um, way you're going to get a 70% retention on a video that's just not and phenomenal. And then back to your point about, like, chapters and the graph of, like, stuff people are replaying. Um, you know, one of the reasons that we, we do those things is because we get feedback from viewers who say, like, you know, creators are making videos that are too long and they're not getting to the point, and I just want to get in there and see the thing that I came for. And because I would never say yeah. anything that makes the viewing experience better is negative because that's ultimately how the platform keeps growing and how we keep our jobs in 10 years. You know what I mean? So if, if people really are like, oh, I'm fed up, I need to just hi find the highlight of the thing I want and go to it, they probably were going to do that anyways. It's kind of my gut reaction. Yeah, if you're seeing your retention go down because people are jumping around, it probably means you're, you're putting too much filler in there. And... Uh, you know, we have to give the viewer the tools to be able to like find what they want. Because if they don't, like some other platform is going to figure it out, and people are just going to migrate because, you know, creators there are have the right incentives to like get to the point. It's just when we make a 20-minute video, we're like, oh no, this one's only 13. We got to do something to make it longer. But you don't. You just do whatever makes the best feel possible. We've gotten 100 million views on like a one-minute video, a four-minute video, an eight-minute video, a 12-minute video, a 25-minute video. Like I, we've gotten ultra viral in every length of every video. I've never, I've never seen anything that says the videos have to be longer. You just have to make videos people want to watch. Really. Um, so that's what I would say. Thanks. It was, it was fun chatting. Thank you. Have one over here for you. Raz, raz, raz. One. Uh, Can I ask I the question? People, I got some texts. Okay. Uh, if you want to uh, hit some of these. So, this is from Renee. Um, are thumbnails less important in the age of mobile and autoplay? I don't even really know what that is, but that was the first text I got. Yeah. I think uh, thumbnails are still important. Um, if, again, like, remember how I said you need to spend time using YouTube and watching it and looking at it through the eyes of the viewer. If you do that, you'll notice that on the home page of YouTube, we've been moving more towards previewing the video, just starting playing it automatically. And like last year, we made it possible for people to actually unmute and just watch right there on their homepage. So uh, s how do you unmute it when it's out of playing? I know uh, there's a little icon on top of the thumbnail. And once you unmute it for one video, then all the other videos will be unmuted as like well. Forever or until you close the app? Uh, until you close the app. Okay. Um, and so what, w what we were finding there is if we spend less time like just showing a static thumbnail and just get people right into the video, you know, they can make better decisions about which videos to watch. And so in the homepage environment, you're going to want to be able to have a good intro to your video, right? Yeah. Um, what techniques do you use uh, to kind of hook people in the beginning? Yeah, well, this is actually something we were talking about a little bit back there. I have noticed that because uh, agreed, now a lot of people, you know, are on their phones and videos ought to play on homepage, which I think they should because sometimes you're like, I don't know if I want to watch that. And then it, when you get the glimpse of the first five seconds, you're like, oh, okay, I do want to watch it. And then you click. Um, so it, it helps you, like, you know, be more confident before you click or tap, whatever. So one thing I've definitely noticed is, like, that when we have it, a like, not dark in the intro, when it's, like, a little bit brighter, like, it tends to do better. Um, which I noticed you also use you know, you sometimes show captions yes. at the front. So yeah. for the people who do ha have it on mute, they can learn more what the yeah, video is about. Yeah, there's things you can do. Just kind of assume that, like, I don't. I mean, you'd have to look, if you really wanted to, what percentage of views came from mobile and browse on mobile, and then you could see. And probably a lot of those people, they're not really even tapping the thumbnail, per se. There's more, they're tapping after they see the first couple of seconds of the video. So when you keep that in mind, you can kind of, gear the first couple of seconds of your video. Like, okay, like he's saying, someone's gonna watch this on mute, they're gonna see this. How does this reinforce what the title is and make them interested? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a small thing and it's not like what's gonna make or break it, but obviously all those small things add up. 
I think we have time for one more question. Yes, uh, thank you a lot for your conversation. I have a question for Mr. Beast. Uh, actually, I know how to increase the, re the revenue on your videos in two or three times more uh -huh. and uh, produce uh, much cooler uh, videos than the Squid Lips. Uh, we have an idea uh, and we got investments from creative director of Apple and uh, also from founder of Vine. And uh, we have a platform uh, we, uh, where you can sell your personal items uh, from your video uh, uh, and as a collectible items. Uh, for example, you got the... What, what's uh, your question? Yeah, just a second. Uh, you got the video uh, with the Orbis, remember? Yeah. Uh, and you could list this video on our platform, for example, 10,000 Orbis, and sell them, uh, for example, uh, for $10. And yeah, you can... Yeah, no, I mean, that makes yeah. sense, but... I uh, can I speak with you uh, after and... Uh, and be nice, be nice. All right. You're good. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would probably just, if I wanted to, just list them on my merch site, you know, just like... No, it's not a merch, it's a, a collectible items that you can uh, sell from your content because uh, you can make a cool content. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. If I wanted to sell, I would probably just sell it on my merch site, though, just to make it, you know, easier. Cause, like, you yeah, know, but we can organize all, right, thank all you of you, everybody. Okay, thank we you. appreciate you. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. That was fun. Wait, did... Did we go over? I, I am curious though. Were, are we, were we just be able to talk here forever? I kind of yeah. wanted to. I have a question. How, how many people here have already done the shorts drive through where the Mr. Beast gumball oh. machine is? Hey, let's go. Okay, I, I see that there are a few hands that are not up. Um, I hear there's going to be some you know, cool surprises there this afternoon. So I would encourage you, if you haven't checked it out, go to the shorts drive through and uh, check out the gumball machine. Thank you everybody for coming out, Thanks. it was fun. I hope you guys learned a lot. Thank you. All right, take care, go for it, take a picture. Well, yeah, just take it quick.